We want to achieve relatively high fidelity with a massive map while allowing the game to run on relatively affordable hardware. Greetings everyone, I'm Mark, one of the producers working on Gilded Destiny, and among other things, former math instructor. Previously, we mentioned that Gilded Destiny is a real-time grand strategy game with 1.6 million hexes, and many of you have expressed concerns about our optimization and questioned the feasibility of performance on such a scale. The current version of Gilded Destiny can run on a computer with a 1050 Ti GPU at 1080p resolution. So today, I want to talk about how our technical artists have achieved the results in our game and achieved this balance of performance and quality. Right from the start, we wanted to make our map hex-based and a globe, rather than a 2D plane. This idea may sound simple enough, but it created a lot of difficult challenges for our team to overcome. Since our map is not a flat plane, and every hex comes with different terrains and mountain ranges that have different shapes and elevations, stitching them together with no gap on a globe becomes quite a challenge. To achieve this, almost no hex in the game is a true hexagon. Not only is every hex unique from one another, but there are also a few pentagons mixed in there. What this all means is our artists cannot simply pre-make all the transition variations between all terrain types, mountains, and elevation combinations and stitch them together. Especially when it comes to mountain ranges, it is nearly impossible to connect one hex to the next smoothly when every hex is slightly different. Therefore, every hex you see in Gilded Destiny is truly unique with a distinct model, even if they may look indistinguishable. When it comes to other strategy games that use hexes, regardless of whether we are talking about civilization or newer entrants like Humankind and others with a similar level of visuals, the number of hexes typically maxes out around 100,000 or so. Each hex typically has a high level of detail, and the effects of the terrains are beautifully communicated to players. We want to achieve that in our game too. On the other hand, there are also strategy games that exceed 100,000 hexes, but the fidelity of the graphics tends to be much poorer, or are simply colored hexes. If they were to try to achieve the same fidelity as those in Civilization, the difficulty in solving the challenge would multiply exponentially for both artists and programmers alike. The game's performance would be unacceptable if a more traditional approach is followed, and requirements for the hardware will also be too high. So to put it simply, we want to achieve relatively high fidelity with a massive map while allowing the game to run on relatively affordable hardware. You may ask, how can we have our cake and eat it too? To achieve this feat, we have two technical artists on our team to solve this challenge. A technical artist is a creative and yet technical person who serves as a bridge between art and programming teams. They need to have an impeccable artistic and aesthetic sense and also be a sound programmer at the same time. They were heavily involved in building and validating the map prototype as well as the subsequent optimization of the game. In the gaming world, where art and programming frequently intersect, the technical artist role has become an indispensable specialization. As we mentioned earlier, stitching the map together with pre-made hexes is not a practical approach due to the number of possible variations, so we need to find another solution. The other solution is to have terrain models for all hexes dynamically generated in real time. However, this significantly increases the complexity of terrain rendering, with the total rendering data for the base terrain occupying approximately 800 megabytes of VRAM and around 1 gigabyte of system memory. Furthermore, the textures and materials used for terrain rendering also reach a staggering 1 gigabyte in size. To put this high demand in check, we employ compute shaders for viewport clipping of the map to ensure that areas not visible on the current screen are not included in the rendering process. This process is able to bring performance to a reasonable level, assuming we don't set the terrain layer to appear at a zoom altitude that is too extreme. Okay, let's discuss some details about how Gilded Destiny's 3D map was created. First, a quick geometry lesson here. An icosahedron is a regular polyhedron, a 3D geometric shape, composed of 20 faces that are all equilateral triangles, including 12 vertices and 30 edges. Our technical artists began visualizing and designing the globe with an icosahedron. From there, they split each one of the faces into much smaller triangles. This was accomplished by subdividing each one of the edges into 400 smaller line segments. To visualize this, let's take a look at what this means. Here is an example of dividing the original triangle on the icosahedron into four triangles by dividing each edge in half, that is, into two line segments, and then connecting the dots. You can see that by connecting these dots, we now have four triangles where the original triangle on the icosahedron was, yet you can still see its outline. 
Now let's step it up to the next level where we divide the edges of the original triangle into four equal parts or line segments and then connecting the dots. From here, you can see that we now have 16 triangles. Also, what's interesting is that you can see that our globe is starting to look more like a globe as we increase the number of divisions. And you can see that when we divide the original triangle edges into even more parts, 32 parts in this image here, that it is actually beginning to look like a globe. Now imagine that each edge was divided into 400 smaller parts. At this point, if we connect all these dots, each large original triangle face of the icosahedron has 160,000 smaller triangles. Remember too, this is per original large triangle on the icosahedron. If we wanted to calculate the number of total triangles on the entire globe, we need to multiply by the number of faces on the icosahedron, which is 20. So we get a total of 3.2 million triangles. But let's put that number aside for a moment, since we're not really interested in triangles, are we? Not directly, at least. However, if each original triangle on the icosahedron has 160,000 smaller triangles, and 400 line segments on each edge, through some math magic, we can calculate that there are 80,601, let's just round this to 80,000 vertices per original triangle. Since we have 80,000 per original triangle, we have 20 sides of the icosahedron, we have roughly 1,600,000 vertices. 1.6 million may sound familiar, right? The importance of all of this is that each vertex is surrounded by a hexagon. However, if you look closely, you will notice a small amount of pentagons, 12 to be exact, each at the original vertices on the original icosahedron. Each one of these hexagon and pentagons has an area roughly of two of our microscopic triangles, the ones we got by dividing the larger original triangles by 400. So out of the 3.2 million small triangular faces, we can divide by two and get 1.6 million hex and pentagon tiles, each centered on one of the 1.6 million vertices. These, industrialists, are our game tiles. Well, in theory at least, because each is slightly different due to terrain features and elevation differences, remember? Based on these 1.6 million vertices, our artists created detailed terrain textures for each hex tile. They determined which material and image range to use for each rendering unit based on the height data for the game's terrain tiles. Then, they blended materials based on each rendering unit and its surrounding units and calculated the specific terrain grid shape visible in real time. The subdivision level for each unit was determined based on the distance from the camera and the rendering unit. New vertices generated for each subdivision were positioned based on texture offsets, resulting in the final shape of each grid cell. In this example, green grids are hexagons you see in the game, while the white lines indicate a drawing instance. Within each drawing instance, we further divided it into several rendering fragments, thus defining the stepped portions of grid height variation, the foundation of terrain changes. Building upon this foundation, we used well-established surface subdivision techniques to achieve the detailed terrain variations you now see in the game. The game's map, obviously, includes more than just the terrain itself. It also includes vegetation, buildings, and armies, all of which are essential. However, due to the unique nature of spherical map perspectives, displaying model objects anywhere on the map became highly unpredictable. Moreover, the map scale led to a large number of objects distributed globally. Loading the position information of these objects on the fly while rotating the map caused significant lag, which was unacceptable. So, we developed an efficient object management system with a paging cache. The primary idea behind this system is to categorize in-game objects and allocate a relatively higher amount of graphics memory to store all model state information compared to other games. We dynamically categorize and merge models in real time, combined with view frustum calling. For buildings, vegetation, special effects, and other resources distributed across the map, we use resident graphics memory. We organize and compress their information and employ batch processing for identical models. This approach minimizes data exchange between the GPU and memory during map runtime. The graphics card handles most of the work, ensuring the map renders quickly when players rotate the spherical world. This system efficiently renders dense vegetation models like the Amazon rainforest and provides good performance for city close-ups. 
Alright, that includes today's geometry lesson. Sorry, I mean dev diary. If you have any questions about some of the math involved, ask away in our Discord and I'll do my best to answer. This particular dev diary was quite unique, serving as a response to some of the questions players had raised earlier. We will return to discussing gameplay in the next dev diary. If this is the first dev diary you watched, please check out our other videos. And if you find the game interesting, please consider giving us a like and subscribe. You can search for Guild Destiny on Steam and add our game to your wishlist. Until our paths converge once more, we bid thee farewell and a gilded day.